anticipating another sinner will soon become his own. Years of wasted living and years of toil and strife are just about to be over as he receives the gift of life. Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. If you would tonight to the book of Ezra one more time, chapter number 10. Thank you for staying with me this morning. You can stand once you find your place. Thank you for staying with me this morning. And uh, <clears throat> I do want to finish <clears throat> finish the message that we began this morning. And uh, I didn't feel like keeping you here till 1 o'clock this afternoon. And so uh, we figured we'd just take a break and come back and finish up this evening. And, uh, but I do appreciate the Lord helping us, Lord, meeting with us this morning. I thoroughly enjoyed service this morning. I've enjoyed service tonight. I do appreciate the good singing, uh, the, the, good, uh, the good awards time to where our young people were, were awarded. And uh, I got to hear from our leaders. And it's just been a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Let's read the first four verses of Ezra chapter number 10. Now, uh, if you'd pray for me, I'd appreciate it. I've uh, not only got this morning's notes, but... I uh, got a few things I jotted down, and so I just pray that the Lord would use it in the service tonight. The Bible said, Now when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jael, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and have taken strange wives of the people of the land, yet now... There is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to all the counsel of my Lord and those that assemble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Arise for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage to do it. Back in verse number 2 we will reiterate what he said. He said, uh, yet now there is hope in Israel. We talked this morning just about that hope when the world seems hopeless. And I want to finish the thought that we began this morning about having hope when the world seems hopeless. Let's pray together this evening. Father, tonight I love you. Thank you for giving us another day. Lord, I sure do thank you, God, for the faithfulness of these young people. Thank you, God, for their hard work. Thank you for their diligence. Lord, I thank you for the faithfulness of these leaders, God, that have taken their time. Uh, God, it's not a paid position. Uh, God, it's not a position of great glamour. But God, I appreciate the burden that you've given them for our young people. God, and the desire for them to grow stronger so that they may 
cause our young people to grow stronger. And God, may we not take that for granted. May we be an encouragement to them. And God, we're grateful for them and all that they do for the, for the glory of God, for the cause of Christ. Father, I pray tonight, dear God, that in the midst of a troubled world, God, in the midst of a, of a corrupt society, in the, in the midst of, of so much turmoil, God, so much division, so much hatred, God, so much confusion. Lord, I pray, God, that in the midst of all of these things, God, we'll look up and God, understand that we can have hope, God, even when times seem hopeless. Would you bless the thoughts tonight? Bless your word, we pray. May Christ be honored. God, and we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. We talked this morning about what it was like about Israel having a national revival. And we talked about, I'm, I'm grateful that America still, could still have a national revival. Uh, we could see it sweep from the south to the north, over the way to the west coast, or it could sweep the other way. I, I'm listening, God can start in the middle out. There could still be a national revival in America. And man, that'd be wonderful. That'd be a great thing to see. And we mentioned this morning, it'd be, it'd be awesome if, if, you know, you'd watch the news media's head spin if the only thing to report in the country was that the reason business was closed down is because there was meetings going on all throughout the community and uh, they were shutting businesses down. They were shutting uh, uh, the normal hustle and bustle of life down. You say, preacher, it can never happen. Listen, it's happened in America before and we serve the same God. It can happen. Uh, but listen, my hope is not contingent upon what society does with the Lord. My hope is not contingent on whether or not society uh, has revival or society doesn't have revival. Uh, just as well as it could be that America could have it, it's quite probable that she won't have. So what are we supposed to do if our country never turns back to the Lord? What, if we're, what are we supposed to do if our country never sees that any longer? Well, we talked this morning, and I just mentioned it, that individual hope is not contingent on society's actions. And we looked at several different examples of that this morning. We're not going to preach the message, but we do know that Ezra prayed personally. Ezra, hope is a personal thing between us and God, and it's not contingent, again, upon what society does or what society thinks or the decisions that society even makes. And so hope is not contingent on society's actions. And then we talked this morning that hope is found in an alliance with God. How do we have hope? Hope is found in having that alliance with the Lord. Uh, they could hope because they were children of God. I'm glad to report tonight, I know I'm saved by the grace of God. I know I've been birthed into the family of God. And because I've been saved, because the Lord is my Savior, just as they read that Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm grateful tonight that I can have hope, even in the midst of a hopeless world, because I'm a child of God. Now that's a great thing. If you leave here tonight and you're born again, as you go out and you face tomorrow, know that you won't be facing God tomorrow by yourself, but you can face tomorrow as a child of the Most High. And they can, they can have hope because they were children of God. Galatians 3, we talked about for a year of the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And then they hoped in the power and the potential of God. Listen, we're not following after one who is weak, feeble, and incapable. I'm grateful that we follow after the Almighty God of heaven. I'm grateful we follow after the one that spoke the universe into existence. Hey, we're, we, we're also following the one not only that spoke it into existence, but the Bible tells us that by Him all things consist, that He's holding it together every moment of every day, of every hour. Jesus is holding everything together. You say, preacher, it's spinning out of control. No, you're listening to the wrong one. He's got everything figured out. Everything is just fine in the Father's house and that's the hope that we have and then affirmation of hope is how we find it in the Word of God I'm grateful that there's a hope that we can read about learn about study about in the Word of God so we talked about those things this morning let's go a little bit further tonight in our message the, the next thing I want to talk about is what about examples of hope how do we really put it to practice is I mean you know is it just preaching or is it really practical you know there's a difference there's a difference you know you can get a lot of information but it's not really practical. Uh, anybody had taken any classes in high school or college that, man, it was a lot of information, but you just don't use it anymore? You just don't use it anymore. Uh, you say, preacher, did you take any of them classes in high school? I don't remember. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that I did. Now, I can't say anything bad about math because if my daughter hears it, she'll correct me. Dad, you use math every day. Maybe, but I got a calculator that does it. Uh <clears throat> But, I, you know, I'm sure all of us took, all of us took certain types of classes. And, you know, and we got a lot of information, but it was really kind of impractical. It's really kind of things that we don't use. Well, listen, I don't want preaching tonight to become impractical. I don't want it to be something that we just sit and say, boy, that was good. 
or uh, man, I never thought about that like that before, but I want us to have something that we can take as we leave here and we go back out there. I don't know how y'all are, but through the week, sometimes, man, we can get beat down by the week. I mean, we can be exhausted and worn out. I think about our young people, and I think about the highs and lows that our young people face, those that are out in society. I mean, they come to church, and hopefully that they feel like this is a place where the people love them and prays for them and cares about them, but they're going to go out to a real world that's looking to devour them. And I mean, they're going out and they're trying to take these principles and this message in the Sunday school lesson and then they go back out to a world that's trying to pull everything that we've put in them back out of them. It's trying to get them to question everything, to doubt everything, to second guess everything. Hey, listen, and sometimes we can just be exhausted. We need practical things that will help us outside. But not only is that our young people, it's the same way in our Christian walk. Man, we're, we're in a place in here. This is a safe haven. And I hope that in 2021, if we've ever got a picture in our mind of a place that we need, a place of refuge, I hope it's the Lord's house in 2021. I hope we appreciate what we have and we appreciate the fact that God has given us a place of refuge and that we can come apart from this world and we can meet together. But we need some practical things that I believe will help us. So let me give you this. Let's talk about some examples of some people who had hope even when things seemed hopeless. The first one I want you to go to is I want you to turn to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations. You know anything about the Bible? You know who wrote the book of Lamentations? Jeremiah. Pin down the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is a book of, of, of weeping and brokenness. It means to mourn. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. So that's a good way to remember, if you would, who wrote the book of Lamentations. In Lamentation chapter number 3, what, what, did, what happened or what gave a weeping prophet hope? I mean, you think about it. By the way, do you know why he was weeping? Jeremiah was weeping because of the condition of his nation. He was weeping because of the message that he had to present and he was weeping over the condition of his nation. How many times have we been broken as Americans over the condition of our nation? How many times have we sat and almost been in disgust and despair on a couch somewhere watching the news or at a desk looking at, uh, looking at, a, at a news broadcast over the internet and we've just almost got our head in our hands and we can't believe that our country is in the middle of what we're in. I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's heartbreaking. You know, it's amazing how we can run through every gamut of emotion, isn't it? How we can go from anger to heartbreak just like that. I mean, I, I, I'm a, I get angry. You, you've heard me say before, I get angry. And I watch it, man, I'm, I'm so frustrated. I'm so frustrated in the system. I'm so frustrated in the people that's in charge. I'm so frustrated in the manipulation. Uh, and listen, I believe in the heresy that's going on even behind our pulpits. And I'm so frustrated at those things. But yet, then, then I turn around and my heart breaks because we're living here. Our children are living here. Our grandchildren are living here. And she ain't what she used to be. Here's Jeremiah, he's weeping. I believe Jeremiah probably went through the gamut of, of that emotion as well. I believe there was times that Jeremiah was aggravated at Israel. I believe there was times that Jeremiah was angry at Israel. But I believe that there was times that Jeremiah was broken over the condition of his nation. But yet we find out here that Jeremiah got some hope. Now listen to Lamentations chapter number 3. Now I'm going to read several verses. You take your Bible and you read along with me as I read. Lamentation 3 reads this way, says, I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned. He turned his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. It's not really a light and airy type of text. It's not really a text that you would say, oh, listen, we're going to read that at Jubilee every night because it's a verse that just inspires me. It's a passage of Scripture that is burdensome. It's a passage, a passage of Scripture that is very dark and very dismal and very dreary. It's a, passion, it's, a, it's a portion of Scripture as you read that it's almost it takes you to a place that you really don't want to go. You see the, the, the heartbreak of this man. He says in verse number 7, He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Also when I cry and shout, He shutteth out my prayer. I'm telling you, it was a dark place. He was in a dark place. 
He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone and made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion secret and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrows. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was in derision, all my people and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul from off peace, far off from peace. I forget prosperity. Verse 18, I said, and I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Hopeless. In a place that he feels like all is lost and hopeless. He said, remember in my affliction and my misery, the wormwood of my gall. When he looked at the circumstances, he said, my hope is perished from the Lord. When he looked at all the surrounding conditions of his nation and all the things that he had been through and that he had even as a prophet endured, he said, my hope is perished from the Lord. But then he said in verse number 20, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled, and is humbled in me. In verse number 21, he said, this I recall to my mind, look at it, therefore have I hope. He has painted a dark picture. He has painted a picture of a place that no one in this room would like to go. There's places in this life that I'd like to travel to. There's places I'd like to go. There's places I'd like to see. Preferably warm places. I'd like to see some, some places. I like to see historical places. I really do. I enjoy When we got to go to Rome, I enjoyed Rome. Uh, Venice was cool. Milan, I'll give you two nickels to go back to Milan. But Rome was really cool. Man, the history of Rome, and to think about, we actually walked streets that the Apostle Paul walked on. That's hard to wrap your brain around, but that's an awesome thing. There's places I would like to go, but I can promise you this, I don't want to go here. I don't want to go here. I don't want to go through what Jeremiah went through. I don't want to have to go through those dark days and those troublesome times and those dark valleys. I don't want to get to the place that it feels like all hope is lost. But I am so glad that Jeremiah didn't have to stay in that place, though that was dark, though that it might have been dingy, though that it might have been a place of pain and suffering and a place of turmoil, Jeremiah said in verse number 21, this I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It's almost hopeless, but I have hope. Man, it looks bad, but I have hope. It looks like I can't make it another day, but I just want you to know there's some things that brought to my remembrance that gave me hope. You say, what is it? Preacher, what was it? Well, I believe first of all, at the thought of the Lord's mercy, he had hope. Look at verse 22. He said, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Amen. Now I want you to think about a man that was in the midst of a nation being judged of God said, it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. Hey, do you know why America has not yet fallen? Because it is of the Lord's mercies that we have not consumed. But let me tell you this. Do you know why we as sinners have not fallen as of yet? It is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Even as saved people, after we've been born again, how many times have we failed God? How many times have we been backslid on God? How many times have we grown cold and calloused and indifferent? Oh, maybe we go through the motions on the outside, but our heart is corrupt on the inside. Yet God is long-suffering. God is merciful. God is kind. And it is still today of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Can I tell you this? I can face tomorrow because of the Lord's mercies. I'm glad they're fresh and new every morning. I'm grateful for the grace of God and the mercy of God. And the same thing that gave Jeremiah hope is I believe the same thing that can give us some hope. And Jeremiah got hope because he thought about the Lord's mercy. Go to Psalm 33. You use your Bible a little bit tonight. <clears throat> Psalm 33, I want to read these verses that the psalmist penned down. Psalm 33, down in verse number 18, the Bible says this, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, and upon them that hope in His mercy. Now did you see what that said? Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them. I'm glad that in this life, as dark as it may be, hey, can I tell you something? There's a God in heaven that's got His eyes on you. 
Oh, listen, as we go through this day and we feel like everybody's forgotten us, everybody's forsaken us, young person, when you're out on, on doing your thing and you're trying to live your life and you're trying to do the best you can and it feels like the walls are closing in, uh, listen, from the outside in, he said, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. Keep your eyes on Him. Hey, listen, moms and dads, adults, as we go through this time of dark days, understand if we'll just hope in His mercy and put our faith and trust in him listen we're still in his eyes and I appreciate that look down with me if you will not only verse number 18 verse number 22 of the same psalm he said the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate none of them you say what is it listen God is merciful verse number 33 uh, chapter number 33 verse number 22 he said let thy mercy O Lord be upon us according as we have hope in thee I believe what brought, he, what brought him hope, to, what brought hope to a weeping prophet was the thought of the Lord's mercy. Psalm 147, verse number 11. Let's turn over there and read this one and then we'll move on to the next thing. Psalm 147, verse number 11. The Bible said, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear Him, in those that hope in His mercy. You're talking about that. The Lord taketh pleasure. We're talking about finding people in a dark day, yet there's still a crowd of people that God takes pleasure in and that's the crowd that hopes in His mercy. What brought Jeremiah hope? Well, I believe he brought, what brought him hope was when he thought about the Lord's mercy. I believe when he thought about the Lord's faithfulness, it brought him some hope. When he thought about the Lord's faithfulness, go back if you would to Lamentation chapter number 3. Listen to verse number 23. He said, They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. I want to ask you a question tonight. Anybody have any disappointments in 2020? Did, did anybody, did any individual person or people group let you down in 2020? Sure they did. Sure they did. Did anybody promise something they didn't keep? Probably. Did you let anybody down in 2020? Probably. Probably so. But the Bible tells me, great is thy faithfulness. You see, God doesn't fail. And God is faithful. God is faithful. And I want us to know something. As we go out into this world, you say, well, preacher, I don't understand. The day's dark and it seems hopeless. Listen, God is the same God of, of the days when it's good. He's the same God of the day when it's not so good. God is faithful. God keeps His word and God keeps His promises. God is faithful. I believe the thought of the Lord's faithfulness is something that, that brought him hope. Down in verse 31 and 32 he said, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. He said God's faith. God's going to do what's right. God's always going to do what's right. God's going to be there right on time. God's going to take care of his young. That's why he promised that he would do that. So I believe not only the thought of the Lord's mercy because of the thought of the Lord's mercy had hope, but I believe at the thought of the Lord's faithfulness, he had hope. Let me give you one other thing. The thought of the Lord's sustaining brought him hope. Look at verse number 24. He said, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in Him. The Lord is my portion. Now I'm going to flip over to the Psalms, and you can turn with me if you want to, but I'm going to flip over because I want to read one Psalm to you. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't type this out, but I want you to listen to this Psalm. Psalm 73, in verse number 26, the Bible said this, the psalmist, the psalmist writes, My flesh and my heart faileth. Now there's the condition of the psalmist. My flesh and my heart faileth. Ever been there? Ever been there? You ever been to the place in your life to where you just, your heart sinks? You feel like throwing up your hands and you feel like there is no use. And there is no strength for another day. There is no strength for this afternoon. There is no strength for tomorrow. I've had all I can stand. I can't go any further. The psalmist said, My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I got to thinking about that word, my portion, or that phrase, my portion. You remember back when, when, uh, when God was dividing out the land of the Israelites? Y'all remember that? <clears throat> You remember there was a tribe that didn't get any. Y'all remember who it was? It was, the, it was the tribe of Levi. They didn't get any land. They got right there. They had to take care of the temple. You know what God said? God said, you got this land, you got that land, you got that land. He said, but to the Levites, he said, I 
am their portion. Can I tell you something? What he said was, he said, listen, they all got land. He said, but I'm enough to sustain you. I'm enough that you need. I'm plenty that you need to sustain you and to sustain the generations to come to sustain not only you, but your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. He said, I am your portion. Hey, listen, I can think of no better portion to have. Houses and lands will disappear. Money comes and money goes, but I'm grateful that we as God's people can stand to say the Lord is my portion. I'm glad He's our strength. I'm glad He's our help. And I'll promise you this, that the Lord is enough. God is enough. I believe you found great hope. Next time you face a lost world, next time you face a dark situation or a discouraging time, maybe you need to stop and do some recollecting like Jeremiah did and bring it back to your mind and say, I can remember the time that I got born again. I can remember the time that I got saved by the grace of God. And regardless of what this world does, my portion is not found out there. But the Lord of heaven is my portion and God is enough to sustain me. Uh, listen, we find a man, uh, a weeping prophet by the name of Jeremiah <clears throat> that God help. Second of all, what about what gave an aged patriarch named Abraham hope? Abraham had some hope too. Take your Bible and go to Romans 4. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 4. Y'all know the story of Abraham. God said, Abraham, you're going to have a son. There's just one problem. They had two things going against them. Number one, Abraham was old. And number two, his wife was old. I'll never forget Brother Barker looking at a couple in a church and he was talking about when the Bible said that they were well stricken. Brother Barker used them for an illustration. I'll never forget that service. He said, they is well, Brother, they's well stricken. That's what he said. And I was like, wow. They had problems. You say, what was it? They's too old to have children. You know what that means? That means that's impossible, God. God, that's impossible. I, Lord, I, I, I'm not trying to question you, God, but, you know, God, you're about 60 years too late. 70 years too late. Listen, I can't imagine having a young at 47, let alone 99. Say, what's going to happen? I'm going to die. Somebody else can raise him. God said, you're going to have a son. He's going to be the promised seed, Abraham. I'm a, he's got, Messiah is going to come through your lineage. They, they'll, he'll rule, listen, he'll rule, Abraham, it's coming through your lineage. God, that's not possible. God, well, what hope do I have in that, God? Listen to Romans chapter number 4. In Romans chapter number 4, in verse number 18, the Bible talks us of Abraham, he said, who against hope believed in hope. Y'all see that in your Bible? It didn't make any sense. The world would say, listen, there's no hope to be found. Abraham, it's hopeless. It's a lost cause. Abraham, it's a done deal. Abraham, the Bible even says you're as good as dead. Uh, and scriptures does say that one as good as dead. Uh, they sprang up from one as good as dead. He said, the, the world would have said, Abraham, it's hopeless. But Abraham, the Bible said, who against hope, believed in hope. I'm telling you something, listen, that helps me tonight to know that, listen, God can do what seems to be impossible. God can do, He's faithful to do what He's promised. And the Bible says, who against hope believed in hope that He might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. If you go over the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, the Bible doesn't actually give us this insight when it comes to Abraham, but it gives us some insight when it comes to his wife, by the name of Sarah. Gives, gives us some insight. And the Bible says of Sarah that she judged him faithful who promised. Sarah said, I'm going to believe God by faith because he's faithful. You know, there had never been a day that up to that point that God had failed Abraham and Sarah. There had never been a moment that God had failed. Oh, they had failed God many times. God had brought them out of a mess time and time and time again. Hey, but there had never been one time that God had failed Abraham and God had failed Sarah. And the Bible said, who against hope believed in hope. Can I tell you something? There's never been a time, if you're honest with yourself and if you're honest before God, there's never been one time that God has failed you. Oh, you may not have understood all the details. 
You, you may not have understood the, the, big, the, the, the major plan of God. You may have not have felt His presence like you wish you had. Things may have not have turned out the way that you had hoped they had turned out. But I can promise you this, there's never been one time that God has failed in His faithfulness. There's never been one time that God has went back on His Word. There's never been one time that God has turned His back on His children because God is faithful. God is faithful. You say, how do you have hope? What, what gave an aged patriarch hope? I believe it was the fact that God is faithful. God is faithful. Who against hope believed in hope. So we see some examples of hope tonight. Let's look next of all at our outlook because of hope. <clears throat> I believe this. I believe when we have really, really genuine hope, I believe it will change our outlook. I'll go on record to say if there's ever anybody in this building that needs an outlook changed, it's, it's me sometimes. Man, sometimes I can get my outlook all wrong. And I'm not talking about you mail server. Y'all get that in a minute. Man, listen, there's times that my outlook's bad. I see everything. I, how many, y'all be honest, let's take a survey. How many of you are glass half full people? How many is glass half empty? How many just hope you can find a glass? <clears throat> that all depends on my outlook, but I can tell you my nature is more, my glass is half empty more than it is half full. That's my nature. My nature is to be negative. I know y'all have a problem believing that. I can be rather negative at times. I can see the, the negativity. Instead of looking at the good things that are being done, oftentimes I see the things that are not being done. See, preacher, that's not a good quality. I didn't say it was, but honesty is, and I know where I'm at. But there's times that I've got to stop and ask the Lord to change my outlook. And by the way, if you're a negative person, we are not living in a society that's conducive to helping a negative person. Because there's a lot of negative things that's going on in our world. And not just our country, I mean the whole world. There's a lot of negative things, and so I need the Lord to help me with my outlook. But when I get my mind off of all the things that are wrong, and get my mind back on the one that's right, I believe it'll change my outlook. Hey, you think about hope for just a minute. You think about giving somebody hope. When you give somebody hope, you know what it makes them want to do? It makes them want to fight. If you give somebody hope, it makes them want to go on another day, another step, another mile, another whatever. Listen, just one more day, one more step, one more journey. Why? They have hope. It changes their outlook. And I want to give you some things tonight about hope that I believe, uh, about an outlook change that I believe will help us. The first thing I believe that help is found in His presence. Look what it says in Psalm, and I'm going to read these for the sake of time tonight, and you listen quick and I'll read through here. Psalm 42, 5, the psalmist said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? You know what he's doing? He's rebuking himself. What's wrong with you? Y'all have never talked to yourself, have you? Anybody ever talked to yourself? Man, I have. Chris, you're an idiot. Why did you do that? I can't believe I did that. Now, normally somebody else is echoing that in my ears. Say, yeah, you're right. You're an idiot. Why did you do that? But you talk to you. You say, why, why are that? You know what he said? He said, what are you doing? Why are you down here in the dumps? Why are you, why are you, you cast down? Why is, why is my soul disquieted in me? What's wrong with you? He said, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a play on words here, and I want you to listen quickly. Psalm 42, 5 says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Down in verse number 11 of the same psalm, he says again, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Now there's two different phrases that's mentioned there. Now the word, the word health and countenance are the same word. But I want you to see this. He said, For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance. That word health means deliverance because of his presence. Now he said, Who's the health of my countenance? But in verse number 42, he says, Who is the help of his countenance? Do you see that? Now let me try to explain this if the Lord will help me. In verse number 5 of chapter of Psalm 42, he said, For I shall yet praise him for the help of 
His countenance. That means we are delivered, if, if you would, by His presence. In other words, we are in the face of God and we get help from His countenance. But in Psalm 42, verse number 11, He said, I'll yet praise Him who is the health of my countenance. Because we've got help from His countenance, He's helped our countenance. You say, what is that? I'm telling you, He can change us from the inside out. Have you ever met, you ever met somebody with people get stupid with a baby? Get stupid with a baby. Now, I'm not necessarily saying this about my wife directly, but I was watching her before service. She's holding Miss Lacey, and they were singing. Miss Lacey would reach up, grab her mouth, and I was like, boy, if I did that, <laughs> if I did that while she's singing, it's over for the Cant Cantrell household. But they'd be pulled back and she'd sing and she'd get her eyes up. She'd best mouth and blah, blah. People get stupid over a baby. You ever, you ever watch somebody? Let me encourage you to do this. This, this whole thing has been crazy. Let me, let me put it this way. This whole thing over the last almost year now has been crazy. We've got people in nursing homes that are dying alone, brokenhearted. Let me encourage you to do something. If you're ever, ever able to make a visit, when you walk in that room, watch the change in their countenance. Look at the change in their countenance. They've, they've been in that room, they've been looking at the same walls, and all they see is the negativity of that place and the condition of their country. They can't see their family, they can't see their loved ones. And then somebody walks in that room. They don't have to say anything. Just their presence changes their countenance. Can I tell you, that's exactly what God will do in our life. Oh, I get help from His countenance because I can see His face. I can get my mind off everything here. But when I see His face, not only does it change my outlook, but it changes my countenance. Why? Because now my hope is not on all these other things, but my hope is in Him. He said, listen, there's help to be found. What about happiness? Everybody's looking for happiness. I just want to be happy. And we just want to be happy. Whatever makes you happy, well, that's really an oxymoron because not everything can make you happy. The psalmist said in Psalm 146, 5, Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Whose hope is in the Lord. And so I'm telling you, it'll change our outlook. Why is it that so many of God's people are miserable? I mean, legitimately walking around miserable. Say, so preacher, it's bad. Listen, change your outlook. Change your outlook. Smile a little bit. Give your face a break. If you're not doing it for your face, give my face a break by you smiling a little bit. And we're walking around, we're full of misery, and we're full of woe, and we're full of burden, and we're so cumbered by everything in this life. Listen, we need a change of outlook. We need a change of scenery, if you will. Get your eyes off the faces of this world, and turn your eyes back to Jesus, and allow Christ to help us, and allow His countenance to change our countenance. He says, happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. I don't, know what, I don't care what you're facing tonight. Whatever you go through, I can promise you this, there's a God that can help you through every bit of it. Every single step. But the question is, is where are you allowing your hope to be? Are you placing your hope in the medical field? Are you placing your hope in the doctors? Are you placing your hope in a preacher? Are you placing your hope in a religion? Or is your hope really coming from the Lord? He said, listen, happy is the man. And then what about healthy? He said in Jeremiah 17, 7, and I'll give you this one and we'll, we'll finish up. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. I want to read the whole context of Jeremiah. So you stay with me and I'll, and I'll flip over there and read it quickly. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 17. And there's a few verses that we'll catch because what he's doing here in this passage of Scripture, he's making a contrast. He's, he's, he's given us two sides of a coin, if you will. And in verse number 5, the Bible says this, Thus saith the Lord, I'm in Jeremiah 17 if you turn there, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. He said, Cursed be that man. For he shall be like the, the, the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhibit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabit it. That is a salt land. In a parched place. Listen, there's no, there's no refreshment there. It's a place of bitterness. It's a place of dryness. It's a place where people are dry. I'm telling you, that's where a lot of Christians are living today. That's where a lot of Christians are at. They're just dried up. 
they're just dried up, and there's they're in a they're in a dry land and, and salt field. I mean, it's just it's just dry. But he goes on to say, he said, for he shall be like the heath of the desert. Then look at verse number 7. Then he says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots uh, by the river and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Hey, we're talking about two people in the same circumstances. It all just depends on where they're planted. It all just depends. Man, one is drying out. Why? Their hope's not in the Lord. But the one that hopes in the Lord, man, they're flourishing. God's blessing and God's doing a great work in their life. They're healthy. They're spiritually healthy. Let me give you one last thing and I'm done. The examples of hope. The outlook because of hope. What about something I believe that everybody's looking for? Everybody's looking for. They're looking for peace. Peace. I just want, I preach, I just want some peace. Uh, most parents, you know what you, you, you couple peace with? Quiet. I just, I just want some peace and quiet. I just want some peace and quiet. There's too much turmoil. There's too much racket. Y'all make too much noise. I don't know if any of you kids have ever heard your parents say, I just want just give me five minutes of peace and quiet. Leave me alone. Don't talk to me. I, I, don't talk to me. No, don't talk to me. Go find your mama. Don't talk to me. I just want peace and quiet. Can I tell you something? When, when the spirit is full of turmoil, you just want peace. There are people literally today all over this world looking for peace, and they don't know where to find it. They don't know where to find it. They're looking at all different kind of avenues. They're looking in politics. They're looking at, 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 social, at social gatherings. They're looking at programs and everything, but they can't find it. They can't find it. But real hope gives peace. Real, genuine hope gives peace. Go to Ephesians. <clears throat> I'm just about done. <clears throat> I didn't say I'm closing. I said I'm just about done. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 11, the Bible says this, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles. Now there's a phrase there, in time past, that we ought to thank the Lord for if we're saved. Because we're not what we used to be. Preach you... Christians ain't much. I don't think much about them. Well, you should have known us beforehand. If you think we're bad now, we was really bad beforehand. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, you are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made with hands. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Look at this. Having no hope and without God in the world. You want to know why this world is hopeless? Let me tell you why. Because they don't have God. That's the bottom line why the world is hopeless. It's not hopeless because of bad politics. It's not hopeless because of bad policies. It's hopeless because this world does not know God. Having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall, partition between us. You see the opposite. The world has no hope. But once we become part of that crowd that has hope, we now have peace. See, preacher, I need some peace. Listen, get your mind focused. Go back to the challenge of verse 11. Wherefore, remember. Wherefore, remember. Oh, listen. Uh, 1 Peter 1.21 talks about the faith and hope might be in God. That's where our focus ought to be. But I'm going to tell you something. He said, wherefore, remember. Going back to the book of, his, uh, of Ezra, chapter number 10, verse number 4. You know what he says? He says, arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. Be of good courage and do it. The men of Jerusalem told Ezra, once they, once they made their, their agreement that they were going to make a covenant with God, he said, Ezra, we want you to arise and you go before the people and you tell the whole nation, here's where we landed. We're all going to make this covenant. We're going to get away, we're going to, uh, get away from, the, from the marriages of the strange wives and all the baggage that come along with that. We're going, to, we're going to unhook from all of that. Go tell everybody. He said, listen, arise. He said, for this matter belongeth to thee. Can I tell you something tonight? This matter, the, the, listen, this matter of hope, when there's time of hope, it's a matter that belongs to you because I can't give you hope. And you can't give me hope, but it's a matter that belongs to you. Ecclesiastes 9.4 
the first part of that verse, and I won't read the whole verse, but it says this, For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. Can I tell you something tonight? It's not too late. The rest of that verse says something along the lines of a living dog is better than a dead lion. You say, preacher, what's the, what's the value of that? You say, well, position don't matter, but a living dog is better than a dead lion. You know why? There's still hope. And if you're still on the top side of this earth breathing God's air, there's still hope. If you're still here and God has gave, given you another day, God has given you another moment, another hour, another moment in time, there is still hope. But you better get your eyes on Him. The matter's up to you. It's not up to me, it's up to you. You see, my hope and your hope is not based on uh, the contingency plans of this world. Hope is individually to be had, individually to be found, individually to be kept. The matter belongeth to you. You can have hope in a world when there is no hope, but you've got to get your focus back on the Lord. Would you stand with me?